being recorded. Okay. Oh, wow. Got the message. I think everybody who joins will also get a warning that we're being recorded. Right. Um, yeah. Got it. Yeah. I just got a warning. I think that's new, huh? Yeah. Uh, what? The warning? Yeah. The, having warnings like that. I mean, you always do it, you know, yeah, audio, yeah, but um, to have one yeah. flash on the screen, I think that's new. Yeah. Well, right. Zoom Zoom is always changing its thing. So when we, uh, but uh, I think, uh, hey, Jim Manning, there he is. Hey. Jeff Adkins, too. Right. Hey, Jim, it's been a long time. Good to see you. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> and so, Steve. Remember me? Yeah. <laughs> hey, Jim, did you get a note? Did you hear that we're recording this when you came into the room? Did it say that we were recording? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I did see that. Okay. Okay. So you, so, but, you know, feel free to tell whatever risque jokes you want. Uh, <laughs> I don't tell hey. jokes. Well, I'm already, I'm already editing all the expletives out of my prepared remarks. <laughs> <laughs> Can we play some Scrabble? <laughs> <laughs> Pinochle. <laughs> yeah, but how do you my do it? My mind is scrambling for euphemisms. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of amazing. Uh, yeah. I didn't know what would happen here. Oh, Edna is in the waiting room. Let's shall we let her in? I oh, yeah. I suppose so. Yeah. I'd say so. Hey, Edna. Hi there. Hi, Edna. Hi, Edna. Hi, Edna. Hi, Edna. Oh. Hey, Steve, you look great. Thank you. Love your you new look good too. <laughs> yeah, that's my O2. Right. Yeah. All the time. It's a fashion statement. Fashion statement, <laughs> right. Hello, Jim. This is fun. <laughs> it is. Being people's faces after all this time. Yeah. Well, I started going through uh, the old panoramas just to see, uh, you know, what was there. And there's quite a bit of, you know, I, I, I was digging out quite a bit of stuff. I can show you that um, to get a history of what one thing I was aiming for was to just uh, know what was the sequence of presidents? We don't have on the PPA website, uh, you know, who was president of PPA at what time? And uh, some of that is recorded in the panoramas up to about 2001. Um, and then it got switched over to the Great Western Observer. Uh, and I haven't, start, I haven't started digging into those yet. But before 1989, I, I don't have anything. Well, so, um, does anybody have any copies of the PPA pointer from 1969? <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm afraid not. I, I should. I, uh, I actually was the uh, um, in charge of the print shop, and that was printed yeah, in the, the Academy. Academy's print shop. Hey, Daryl. Welcome. Hey. Uh, <laughs> hey, Daryl. Hey, Daryl. My goodness. Oh, I'm busy, man. <laughs> Steve, what's up? Whoa. Oh. Hey, Daryl. Man. Blast from the past. Hey. Still hanging in. <laughs> oh, man. Cool. Good to cool. see you. Good to see you, too. Good to see you, too. <laughs> yeah, Bing, Kwok, Bing Kwok's in the waiting room. He's coming in. All I didn't right. think he would. I didn't think Bing could make it, but uh, by gum, there he is. He squeezed in. Gail Shades in the waiting room. I'll let her in. Oh wow! All right. <laughs> there she is. Hi, Gail. Hello. Hey, I have to adjust this. Hang on. Hi, I Gail. To, I have to put you down for a minute. Oh, eh. can't put us down. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll still be out there in the air. <laughs> 
Okay. I just have to adjust my leg. Yeah. Had a knee replacement, so. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Well, that happens. Carla had that. He had both of them replaced at the same time. And oh man, it's like, it was amazing. She's just like 30 years younger. It's it's just been phenomenal. Absolutely great. Nothing but good wow. things to say about. Uh, how, how long ago did that happen, Gail? Uh, June how long 4th. Ago was your replacement? June 4th. Oh, real recently. Yeah. Well, and then and then I had uh, I I got results from biopsy of cancer. So um, I had a lumpectomy yesterday. Oh, you got the answer? Huh? Where'd everybody go? There you are. Dale? Yes. Did you get the answer? Uh, the results back? No, not yet from the lumpectomy. So it'll, it'll be a day or so. The diagnosis was made a while back, though, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, yeah about two weeks ago. Hmm. Hey Bing, Hello, I thought you couldn't. I thought you couldn't make it. I'm glad to see you. I, I can make it. I just had a slow booting computer. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was all dark. I thought that you might just be in the planetarium. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see everyone. Yeah. yeah. And likewise. Well, at some Alan, point, actually, we are recording this, but I'm Alan, gonna. What was that? Alan, I don't see anybody else. It looks like you're all in your black planetariums. Is there so? Am I doing so? Oh, there you are. Well, there you are, but I can't see anybody else. Are you on a laptop? Yeah. Are you on a laptop computer? There's a button that says view, uh, and you can view either by gallery view or by speaker view. And if you put it on gallery view, it's but in my on my computer, it's in the upper right corner. Uh, I'm on a Mac. But uh, if you put it on gallery view, you see everybody at once. And uh, well, right I, now, I, I have box. I see boxes with everybody's names, but no, no actual um, mugs. Oh, that must be a setting. Yeah. Hmm. There yeah. might be a stop video button or something. Because yeah. uh, we can see you. Yeah. I saw you guys start, but all of a sudden you all went away. Oh, you might have accidentally hit don't display video or something like me. that <laughs> oh yeah he did it to himself technician yeah. tech, i need a technician <laughs> yeah. you need a 10 -year -old. i'm well, on an one, ipad and we have I a always had switch a, to actually speaker buttons problem one thing for sure i want to do before we uh, go too far into this is to get a group picture so I'll take a, I'll t in fact, I'll do, I'm going to take a screenshot right now. Oh, yeah. Screenshot. And then I can send that around or post it or whatever. There's, there's my first screenshot. Bing? Why are you so red? I don't know. There's something weird with my camera. It's not makeup or anything. <laughs> we thought you were deeply embarrassed. That's <laughs> Spending too much time in the sun, I guess. I don't know. Eating too many strawberries. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Maraschino cherries. That would that would definitely do it. <laughs> All right. So, Alan, uh, your idea of putting together a list of uh, previous mm -hmm. presidents, I think, is great. And if you could publish that, and then people can fill in stuff, <laughs> that would that would be really good as a starter for our uh, history page on on our website. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I started getting that. Um, I started getting that together by, you know, going through the old panoramas uh, just to find out. But uh, if people here have. Uh, have met, well, actually, you know what? I could share my screen. And. Uh, and show you what I've got, you know, in I'm terms of the history. About uh, about the pointer uh, publication, how long would, did that go, and how often were they uh, put out? About two years, Mike. Something like that. Yeah, I was the editor, and Steve was, produced it. Uh, you know, we yeah. both worked at Morrison. Um, oh, wow. To go back to the very beginning, because uh, uh, Steve and I were there, it was either sixty-seven or sixty-eight. I think it was nineteen sixty-seven. 
and uh, there was still there was still what was called at the time uh, NDA money, which was National Defense Education Act. It was leftover uh, Sputnik, you know, <laughs> money from the government. You know, well, oh, we need more science education, and I think it actually may have built some high school planetarium someplace, but. Uh, they gave money for small meetings, and so uh, the the formational meeting of the Pacific Planetarium Association was at Foothill College, and Lee Bono was the first president. Correct. Oh, um, I think I think that was in maybe seventy one because I remember going to that right after I got a job. No, it was earlier. It was sixty eight. Was it okay? Well, there was another one at. Oh, it was, I'm thinking of the one that was at De Anza a while after that. Yeah, yeah, th those were on for a while. Norm Sperling. Hey. Oh hey, Norm. God. Hey, Norm. <laughs> hey, Norm. Hey, you. I'm really glad to be here. Oh, man. Absolutely. We oh, all yeah. are. <laughs> <laughs> and we're still here. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Alan, at, at some point, maybe offline, Send me a mailing address. I've got three copies of early editions of the PPA pointer from uh, first one I've got is March, May 69, and it's number three. And so there were some others that I don't have. And then uh, June to August 69 and uh, fall of 69. God, I guess we were trying to do it every few months. Hey, don't, then, right? don't we have those in the file somewhere? We might. I'll have to dig around and go see. Through my, go through my junk because I'm pretty sure I didn't bring them with me. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, for the pointers and whatever, it, the the well, thing to do is the, office. the thing to do is to scan them. And uh, if you don't have the wherewithal to scan them, uh, you know, you could send them to me, and I can actually. You don't have to scan them. Just take your damn smartphone and take a picture of each page. I'd that's the, that's equivalent to scanning, they'll be, actually. They'll belong to the PPA. I don't need them anymore. So, okay. you know, I'll just mail them to you and let you do the work. Okay, I'll send you my email. I mean, I, <laughs> I'll send you my real address. <laughs> yeah. Snail mail. Snail mail, yes. <laughs> snail mail. Somebody named Mary, and then it's a parenthesis planetarium. Who's that? It's Mary from Morrison Planetarium. I'm Mary Holtz. I'm on my way to lunch. So I'll be just pop. Mary is um, um, our, our planetarium specialist at Morrison. Huh. Okay. And uh, yeah, she's been there for a few years now. Super. What's, what's her last name? Holt. Like Holt. Yeah, planetarium. okay. Yeah, I, I knew that. <laughs> I'm going to change the name so that people know. Uh, you can't, normally you can change your name, but we have our security settings set that, so that Zoom bombers can't come in and yeah. wreak havoc. So it's Mary um, Holt. Uh, Mary Holt, yeah. Holt? H-O-L-T. Okay. We used to Alan, have- a you know how to spell Holt. Yeah, no, we used to have a planetarium <laughs> named uh, at Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> That's Mary's planetarium. Yes. It was. No, no, I am the planetarium. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mary's on her road to being an old timer. Yep. I guess everybody is, huh? Sooner or later, it'll get you. We're all getting there. So, uh, yeah, that'd be great to get uh, old issues of, uh, God, I didn't even know it was called, I think I heard that word, the pointer, one time. A pointer, yeah. But it I was. Think, I think I actually have the printing plates for it somewhere. <laughs> Whatever good those are. Yeah. No. Actually, Norm, you were, you were the historian for us at one point. I don't know. Did you have a box of stuff that you kept or? or uh... I had a box of stuff that. Um, I put together from stuff that I had and one retiring member gave me a bunch of stuff. Unfortunately, that was around the time of my divorce. And I had to uh, be careful of what was around the house because strange things happened to what was around the house. So I, uh, I was teaching at Sonoma State in those years. So I 
put them in a box and took it to my office in Sonoma State. Uh, that was probably in 98 or 99. But I, uh, uh, but the family situation didn't allow me to work there anymore. Um, and by the time I got a, a chance to check into it about five years later, nobody was sure where it was. Uh, it wasn't in my old office anymore, but it could have been in their old workroom. But that was so piled high with everybody else's boxes of stuff that they weren't sure. I had marked the, the box a PPA, do not discard. Uh, but I haven't seen it in more than 20 years. So and then the modern in modern parlance, we say that went into the ether. <laughs> Alan, I had, uh, I had some things in a box for a while. When I retired, I gave it to Benjamin Mendelssohn. Oh. So he's got them somewhere in his garage, I believe. <laughs> Bing? That could this, be the This ether. is Steve. Bing. Hi, Steve. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah, I may have <clears throat> I may have archived those with the other stuff from the planetarium. So I don't know whether the library still has my stuff in the boxes I gave them or whether they've actually tried to file it. <clears throat> but I did give them about yeah. six boxes. But it might be there, the EPA stuff. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll try to check. Archives is kind of a mess right now, but uh, I'll. I, I'm sure I'll it is. Them. Yeah. It, it was a mess 20 years ago, too. Yeah, well, they just found a big pile of, uh, of uh, panorama artwork behind one of their big heavy cabinets that's now too heavy <laughs> to uh, move. I mean, I saw it stacked against the wall, and I said, okay, be sure not to block that with any furniture. Guess what? They blocked it with furniture. Yeah. <laughs> well, Alan, when you... Archive. Yeah. <laughs> safe for a while. It's safe, yeah. Yeah. Alan, whenever uh, you were trying to get set up with Nevada State, uh, I checked with CSN to see if any of Dale's, Dale Etheridge's old stuff was still there. And uh, it's it's just, it's up in the ether too, I guess. Nobody there knows anything about any, anything left over. Yeah. Well, thanks for checking. Uh, David Seidel, you, are you in Southern California? Yeah, so to, to uh, I think it was Jim's point, yeah, I, I qualify as an old timer because I've been inactive for I don't know how long. So I actually uh, taught astronomy and ran the planetarium at uh, Beverly Hills High School that was built with funds that were Sputnik money. So it was, a, it was what we still refer to as the new building, some of the old timers. And uh, because it was a new construction and the federal funds were there, they matched at least 50% of it. And we ended up with a uh, very nice Fitz A4, which they're not using today. But uh, since 90, I've been at uh, JPL, run education program. So I had a chance on occasion to work with you and Edna and things like that. But I've been kind of only hanging on to the planetarium world uh, uh, kind of by my fingernails. You, you were, yeah, you were our NASA connection for a while. That was, uh, yeah. I remember. So Jeff Nee uh, works in part of my section. That's right. David, do you know uh, Michael Green? Is he still there? Yeah, he's my boss, actually. Oh. You bet. So Green he's the director for communications and education. Yeah, tell him hello from Mike Bennett. We worked together, hello. you know, 20, yeah. 20 years ago or so. And hello from Edna. Yeah, Yeah, you bet. So David, yeah, is still you're still working then. Yeah, sad but true. Yeah, I've got 31 <laughs> years in at uh, JPL now. <laughs> Well, that's pretty Russ, wonderful. We who are retired, you know, thank you for contributing to our social security and thank you for your service. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate if you not wouldn't use it all up by the time I need it. <laughs> Hi, Jim. Jim, Jim. Regina says hello. Hello. Regina. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Tell, tell Regina, um, hello back. She heard. <laughs> Say, if, if all else fails, um, I have access to the IPS history files through John Hare in, uh, here in Richmond. 
Um, and I know that the files contain histories on all the affiliates. So I, I, I could take a look and see if any early pointers or planetariums uh, are in those files. That'd be great. When did the panorama begin? I, I have that as uh, the first one I have is 1989. 89. But I think it, I think there may have been some before that. There must have been because, uh, because I think when I became president of PPA, I ran on the platform of restarting the panorama. <laughs> I know the Davis Planetarium was using panoramas before 87. Okay. So we're, so it'd be nice to get hold of those older panoramas too. Well, Alan, didn't you, didn't you run for president more than once? Uh, <laughs> it could be, yeah. Times. <laughs> could be. So, you, so the platform, when, when were you president? Um, let's see, I was looking that up in the panoramas. I was president in 1989. My first, my first presidency was 1989. Of course, I've been trying to get a uh, presidency forever. You know, the, uh, the Vladimir Putin of the PPA. <laughs> but, but no, I couldn't do. No, I didn't really want that. <clears throat> I think my second presidency was. Uh, I haven't. I have to look that up. It must have been in the 2000s sometime. But then. Uh, Alan, Lonnie I Baker. Think that's the PP. Lonnie Baker was president after me. And then John Elvert, you became president. I became president after Lonnie, which was in 1993. 93. 93, 94, yeah. Uh-huh. And, uh, and then I think Gail, Gail was president after that. I think that was before that. No, I think it was, it was after John. What? Was it? It was after John was president. Yeah, I've actually I'm looking at what I've fished John. out of the uh, panorama files, and it was Lonnie was sort of flipping back and forth between secretary. She was the secretary treasurer when I was president. Uh, Dale Etheridge was the membership chairman. Both of them, of course, have passed away. Um, and then and then Lonnie became president, and the secretary treasurer was Ken Adams. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. He was up at, at Reading. Right, right. And I, I don't know, I haven't been able to contact him. Um, then when John was president, uh, Lonnie, Lonnie became secretary treasurer again. Um, they, and uh, let's see. Then there's also the other officer that's of note is uh, the IPS rep. Lonnie was the IPS rep for quite a while, and then John became the IPS rep. Yeah, I became in uh, uh, 94. So right. I, was, I was rep for up until 03 when I became IPS president. <laughs> right. Yeah. You become rep and then you become president. Yeah. Hey, Adam, uh, I think I was president of the PPA just before you were first president. So that would have been in the late 80s. Okay. Um, I had uh, a fall meeting there at, in, in Salem at the Community College Chemeketa, and I hosted uh, the meeting. And as a reward, I was elected president. I think we were doing that in those days. I think that's how John, uh, when hosting something in Eugene, ended up as president after taking us to Crater Lake. Yeah, you host a conference and then you become president. Yeah, the reason I know I, I know this is that in that 89 edition that you are referring to, uh, I submitted a bill for mail uh, at the business meeting. And that was a throwback to sending out invitations and working with uh, people that contributed uh, to our, you know, benefit dinner or, or banquet 
So that must have been around 87 or 88, somewhere in there. I, I was afraid you were going to say that we never paid you for that bill. <laughs> what would the interest be at this point? Yeah. <laughs> Probably no interest at all. <laughs> It wasn't Tom Gates, uh, uh, you know, a, a primary leader on getting the PPA uh, established as as an organization. It was kind of beginning to happen across the country, and it kind of caught on out here. And I, I was as an usher at Morrison Planetarium. Tom had me come over to one of those form uh, meetings uh, to discuss the organization. And uh, Billy Smith, I think, was there, Levin A, uh, and others that, uh, you know, filled the tables in one of the adjoining rooms next to the planetarium, the Merry Treat Room or something like that, Steve, outside one of the doors to the planetarium. It's where they had all the displays of leaves and plants and whatever. It was Botany Hall. Yes. Um well, I believe we were actually. I'll think of her name in a minute. Uh, <laughs> Alex, I was uh, wondering. Uh, yeah. You and I were at that very. I think you were there, the very first meeting in '67 or '68 with down at Foothill, with Lee Bono, and uh, I was trying to remember who else was there. And I, you know, Tom just mentioned uh, Billy Smith from Chabot College. Yeah. What about Leonard Who else? Uh, there were there were a few from Southern California, um, Orange Coast College, uh, Ortel or something like that. Was Ed Ortel? Ed Ortel, I think he might have been there. Do you remember who else might have been there? I was thinking it could have been Larry Toy and uh, Don Warren, who was. Uh, uh, no, Larry Toy came along a little later. This is we're talking okay. '68 or '69 uh, here. Don Warren was at uh, the Rosicrucian, yeah, and he may have been there. Yeah. Yeah, he might have been there. Can you remember who else, Steve? No. It's sort of a blank for me, too. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's reaching back. So that we're talking about the beginning. The very beginning. Exactly. Yeah. The beginning of the Let's universe. Start. The Big yeah. Bang. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I think one of the things that were on the agenda is that the Morrison took a, a lead role because a lot of these smaller facilities um, were able to collaborate and maybe even borrow a projector if needed for a particular show. Uh, Steve would know about that, but uh, it kind of like Morrison was the big brother or sister and um, everybody looked up uh, to to their leadership there. You know, we were putting on shows like no one else there in the Bay Area at the time. And so um, uh, we had quite a reputation, a very positive reputation. And just looking at some of these 1969 issues of the pointer, which I showed some of the people, I've got three of these. Um, <laughs> Uh, right. And uh, looking at the at the news section, I see a reference to Charlie Baumgren, but I can't remember what kind of time he was at. That name does not ring a bell. Well, he was yeah, vice no. president in uh, January of 69. <laughs> Who was that, Mike? Charles, Charles Baumgren, B-O-M-G-R-E-N. I'm, I remember you know, the I, name. I, I recognize the name, but I can't remember what planetarium he was from. Uh, there was a. Uh, uh, they were at the. We were at the Schlesinger, Plan Schlesinger Planetarium, which was a. Oh no! Well, or Citrus College in Azusa is where we had our meeting in January of '69. Mm. Where, where was that again? Um, Citrus College. Citrus College. In Azusa. Where is that? That's a Southern California, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Wonder I didn't Orange, know. Orange County. <laughs> well, of course, the other big planetarium was the Griffith. Yeah. And uh, 
I you know I Mosley. Mosley, uh, well, let's see. There was Mosley, and there was who was the director there? Uh, Ed, John Mosley and Ed, Ed Krupp was the director. Ed Krupp, later. Ed Krupp yeah. was director. Yeah. Yeah. Still is. He's still, still the director. Of yeah. Yeah. Still yeah. Wow. yeah. There was an wow. announcement in one of these pointers about Ed Krupp being appointed the director. Um, I'm on Zoom meeting. Well, you know what? I I fell down on the job. Uh, I did. I could have could have tried to reach out to Ed Krupp. See if he would reply and be here. John Mosley. Mosley. I don't know where. I don't have contact information for John. I think I heard he was in a motorhome. Across yeah, the that was years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's the last thing I heard. Yeah. I think Dale Smith still contact is in contact with him. Oh. I'm I'm looking at the PPA news from the June August 69 issue. The March 69 meeting, 19 members of the Southern Region met at Palomar Junior College in San Marcos. And uh, Crutchfield Adair, that name rings a bell from Santa Barbara. Oh, um, speaking of Santa Barbara, there was Fred Marshak was Fred Marshak was there. We had the mm -hmm. conference there in 1989 at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. I remember that one. Remember that giant blue whale they have. <laughs> <laughs> I also see I'm looking at a name called Bob Loper, L O P E R, Chafee College. Yeah, Fred uh, retired from Santa Barbara and moved back to Pennsylvania a few years back. And it was a it was a California gray whale out front. Hmm. Oh, we know the we know the actual species now. <laughs> 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 delivered uh, itself to the shoreline important details <laughs> the morrison had dolphins yeah out front and yeah uh, well we had uh, the uh, pilot whale fountain in the central courtyard and then we had uh, the live dolphins swimming in a pool uh, in the aquarium um, which some people um, figured out how to climb up onto the roof so they could go swimming with the dolphins at night <laughs> which became an issue and so they, uh, when they decided the environment was not as humane as it ought to be for dolphins, they, they moved the, the dolphins out and replaced them with sharks in that tank. So <laughs> heard about nighttime swimmers ever again. Okay, that's, that's the kind of story that we're really looking for here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tall tales. <laughs> Mike? Yes. Thing, what, what they had whale pools in front of the aquarium out in the courtyard, didn't they at one time? In the 50s, uh, late yeah. 50s, um, there were three um, sunken pools that had stellars, sea lions, and, and seals. And they were taken out in the late 50s, I think, and replaced with Robert Howard's uh, Pilot Whales Fountain. Yeah, I think the, the, the history that I remember is that the seals kept eating all the coins that people threw in there and it actually was fatal to the seals. Oh. Yeah. Or just the academy couldn't afford to be without the coins. <laughs> well, the alligators started collecting those after a while. Ah. Yeah. And you go into the aquarium and you could see the alligators covered with pennies. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> I have kind of a funny story to tell about the aftermath of Loma Prieta. I was working at Independence Planetarium, which was a 30 foot dome. And the dome itself was hung from the ceiling of the building with massive chains. So when an earthquake happened, the dome would swing back and forth oh, over your head. And after, Loma, after the Loma Prieta earthquake, a couple of weeks later, I had a group of, I don't know, fifth or sixth graders in there. And, they were kind of nervous. It's an unusual environment. And we were still getting substantial aftershocks. And a little kid puts his hand up and he said, 
what happens? Because I told him that it was hanging from chains. And, I, and he said, what happens if there's an earthquake? And I said, well, the dome will move back and forth. Whereupon we got a four and a half and it swung grandly back and forth upon cue. <laughs> and he said, well, can you do that again? And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> that same year in the summer is when we installed the um, SPICE automation system from Skyscan. Because mm -hmm. I mean, things got so complicated. The the presenters, the lecturers, were having a hard time doing everything and talking simultaneously. So we had that installed in the summertime, and then uh, in October we had the quake. And mm -hmm. so I, I I called Ginger up in New Hampshire and I asked her if the warranty covered earthquakes. <laughs> she wasn't amused by that question. <laughs> You've reminded it, me it, of a of a sort of a funny, but it's a very personal. Well, it's, it's just about me, but that's okay. Uh, you know, most of us at some time in our life have had anxiety dreams. And a very common one I've heard from other people is it's finals week in college. And I just realized that I signed up for a class that I never attended. And now I have to take the final. I don't know if other people have heard of this anxiety dream, but I actually had it a few times. And, uh, but but I have my own version of it, which is that I have to to give a planetarium show in the next few minutes. When, and these were live and, you know, you did everything by yourself. You know, you manipulated the console and you talked. And so I have to give a show. But since the last time I was in the planetarium, they've completely remodeled the console. Oh, and no. I don't know any of the switches or dials oh, no. or how to cue the no. music or anything. Yeah, I've got to go in and get a show. And I've actually had that dream. <laughs> okay, we'll have a show of hands of everybody who had that dream. <laughs> oh, I guess I'm relieved to hear that. <laughs> First public program that we did at the Independence Planetarium, I'd gone and gotten a whole bunch of pictures of the Mars Viking mission and put together this program multimedia thing. And, and, um, had reasonable attendance you know we were opening and people wanted to see the place and so i had it all automated because this was a spitz 512 with the automation and whatnot and i'd worked really hard to get it automated so the slides would run properly and i could you know do the whole thing and the automation failed so mm -hmm. here i am with my head absolutely buried turning switches and pushing up and down dimmers and knobs and buttons and stuff and a young man comes over and he taps me on the shoulder and he says, Miss, I think your machine is on fire. <laughs> oh no. And I looked up and I pulled the lights up and there was smoke coming out of all the little holes around the bottom of the case where the Northeast Southwest projectors were going. And what had happened was a transformer underneath that ran the elevator had smoked out. So I had to clear the building and call the fire department and we were down for two weeks. Yeah. That was the first public program. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so, you know, disasters happen. You know, Mike or Keith, just, you know, flip buttons and give the show that's being presented on the dome. Just go with whatever's, you know, we accidentally did. Right. <laughs> I remember when I worked at Triton College outside of Chicago, we had a, a fairly new, uh, one of the first uh, Spitz uh, A4s that was fully automated and that used some fairly primitive automation system with tones and the most common failure mode uh, was what we call the religious experience because <laughs> it turned on everything at the same time <laughs> <laughs> and you would just stand there and watch this thing whirring and buzzing and slide projectors flashing on and off you stand there and just go Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's that, a religious experience. That happened a couple of times with the 512 too. It's just like yeah. all of a sudden it's tumbling and you know, yeah. everything's going on. It's crazy. <clears throat> I heard a similar story about the Morrison's original automation system, which was cued by strips of uh, aluminum tape on yeah. the audio tape. And <clears throat> the story is that it would turn things on, but it wouldn't turn them off. <laughs> so by the end of the show, everything was up. I don't know if it's true or not, Steve. It was a, it was a the, the little contacts on the on the tape, the little pieces of silver tape they put on the tape, and it would then make a contact, and that would step a stepping switch, an old-fashioned 
I don't know if anybody ever seen them, but they were in, used in telephone exchanges. They would have, uh, there was a stepping switch that would just go around. Well, if it missed any one of those, the stepping switch was no longer correct to the, to sync, the soundtrack. Yeah. So it was, the system never, and we used to experiment, I think we gave a demonstration, didn't we, Mike, of what it was supposed to do, yeah. but it never worked. It was a failure from the very beginning. And, uh, and in fact, we built some other exhibits in the museum over time that used the same kind of stepping switch. It, it, it doesn't work. You need to have a computer that knows where it is. Yes. And, and when, once that technology came around, everything was easy to do. But it, it, when something has to stay in sequence, it's hard. But really for some hard. years after that, we continued using that kind of system to stop the tape after the audio sequences. <clears throat> That's so correct. we could start them manually from the console. And then when the, the tape ran across that conductor strip, it would stop the tape, which was fine. It worked most of the time. Yeah, but if it if it ever failed, of course, that wasn't such a disaster as having your whole show on a sequence. Hey, Ken Miller. Yeah. Welcome, <laughs> Ken Miller. Here's an old timer. Yeah. Came in late because I'm retired and an old timer, you know. <laughs> I means nothing to you anymore. Hey, Ken. Uh, good to see you all. <laughs> and Jack Dunn is here too. Uh, he's he's a. Uh, and I and I'm actually uh, at a uh, beach uh, place right now with other planetarians who are uh, where they're getting ready for dinner. But anyway, I have I have two stories for you about. Uh, missing or well technology number one uh, we used to have a side console that we had built on our own uh for a fact and it was it wasn't even a, to say a brand it wasn't even a jhe thing it was we built it okay but it was kind of flaky at times and there was one place where i think there was a solder solder position or something that wasn't good so i'm during a show uh and what happened was that the, the connection would get loose and I'd have to come around to the side and crouch down and open the back and try to fix this thing. <laughs> well, I had a student assistant there, we were running the show and the thing flaked out. So I crouched down behind this thing, opened the back. So I'm now down, crouched down below she thinks that she needs to help me and reaches over the console and pokes me in the eye. <laughs> and thank goodness she didn't have like long nails or whatever. And I'm sure I said something, but hopefully the soundtrack covered it up. <laughs> the other one was Patty Carey, who started the very first planetarium in Hutchinson, told a story about the very first planetarium show the very first planetarium they had was built inside of a chicken coop in the state fairgrounds. And they had built their own little projector, but the projector really was, you know, very home built. And it had, it, it, it didn't have like a whole set of controls. It had, it was sitting on this cabinet and uh, the, the power was, you know, down in the cabinet, he plugged it in. Well, they got this great idea that they would have a student crouch down in the cabinet and they were going to do this dramatic opening. Uh, so what happens is they have the student down inside there and the uh, other student who is doing the, the live presentation starts out and says, and God said, let there be light. Nothing happens. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> The uh, student goes on, well, you know, let there be light. Still nothing. He tries it a third time, nothing. When he's beaten on the cabinet, whatever. Meanwhile, inside, the student inside is doing this with his fingers with the outlet, trying to find his way in there, <laughs> to plug this thing in. Just about that time, he managed to stick his fingers on the uh, AC, <laughs> screams and yells, holy shit. And not only 
did the stars not come on, but they blew the breakers in that part of the uh, state fair. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the very first show in, in Hutchinson in a planetarium. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Patty told that story a number of times. She it was you know, so you know you could be. <clears throat> it was sort of biblical or something. Mm -hmm. Another know. religious experience. <laughs> yeah, religious experience. And I mean, I had I had the star machine <clears throat> during a laser show. The the elevator failed. And but what it is is it's supposed to have, you know, a thing that's that's holding it up there. When it when the elevator would raise up, it would it would lock into position. Well, that thing was failing, so it's going down. But the problem is the projector is now this way rather than vertical. So oh, no. you know that they had a little switch, micro switch in there that if the projector was not vertical, you couldn't activate the elevator. So it's laying like this and I'm hitting the elevator button and it's still going down and it wedged itself like a beached whale across the, uh, oh, the, the old dog house. And yeah. we had to cancel the rest of our shows for that night because we couldn't get, we to say it, we couldn't get it up. Not <laughs> only that, but I didn't know where the micro switch was to, uh, to turn off that uh, thing. And I had to wait until like Monday before we could talk to Spitz to find somebody to tell me where to, you know, fix the connection. But the thing was, yeah, it was just like a beached whale across the, and it also bent the planet cage a little bit. It was a, it was a bad night. So you see, <clears throat> we used lasers for years and had no accidents, but star machine and other stuff, it happened all the time. Speak I bet you you never had um, your planetarium drowned. <laughs> uh, oh, oh Daryl's got a story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and I think Ken Miller knows this really well, too. So I teach at the Carter San Mateo. And we had uh, an OFEP in a separate building, building 13. Then we had, due to the bond issue, we got money to build a whole new planetarium, 40 footer, and Beautiful. observatory. And uh, in it, we had a Kronos, okay, first Kronos. So, about six weeks after we opened up, during a lab I was teaching, not doing a show, during a lab I was teaching, the sprinkler system came on. No one was near the sprinklers. The lab was almost finished. And there was a total, I forgot, total loss. They just poured water into the planetarium. Deluge water system. Del deluge, the deluge yeah. system. And it, it flooded. And we had our Kronos in an elevator. The elevator was, I forgot how many feet deep of water. And so the whole dome, me especially, is soaked. You know, and, and, a, and I was running out of the building, took off my shirt, was wringing it out and crying because the planetary was destroyed. Oh, so that uh, took us out for quite a while. Wow. And then we got after, and then it but was, Sam nobody knows how that, how that happened. Go ahead, Ken. San Mateo was the only place that I got to sell two Kronos projectors to <laughs> replace it. Ken, with how did it occur? Even after that, underwater. <laughs> did it? Did, did you could have added some effects on the Kronos with fish or something? You know, fish projections. Uh, you know, that was another religious experience, Daryl. Oh it yeah, was, it was the deluge, the flood. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, well, Daryl, we have the same deluge system installed in our dome, and ever since we heard that story, we've been very, very nervous about. You it. have the same system. Yeah. Yes. Oh God. <laughs> the same thing oh. happened in mid in uh, Big Spring, Texas, to a friend of mine. He he couldn't. He didn't work there in the summer. He couldn't, and so he put his A three P down into the into the into the down the elevator and over the summer they had a 
fire extinguisher system break and he came back in the fall and the whole thing was underwater. It was pretty bad. Well, I think that my wife's planetarium has somewhat of the same system because they originally, well, of course, originally the architects said, oh, you have to install sprinkler heads in the dome. They finally convinced them out of that. By the way, she was not hired before the planetarium was essentially built. So, you know, they had no direction from anybody that knew anything about planetariums. Well, at least it, there are two sprinkler heads up in the top. They're there. Everybody thinks they're the, those are the projectors. They're kind of met towards the back. But the thing is that then they also installed sprinkler heads all the way around the base of the dome. And uh, 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 they gave her, there's a red panic button at the console that supposedly if something goes off, you're supposed to hit it. But the guy who installed it said to Liz, you might as well not bother because even if you hit that button, you're gonna be in an aquarium. <laughs> and it's like what kind of you know that okay you've designed it to do like this and you know it's like that why don't you tell somebody or no 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 oh sure i'm sure there's a regulation that calls for your theater to be a you know full of water i i just know that that will make everything safe right yeah well this goes Man. along with the uh, exit sign issues uh yeah. Like, uh, yeah. All planetariums that you the battles between fire marshals and uh, planetarium people. <laughs> I have a question because I was on another Zoom and I and there was somebody who was building a new theater and they were told that if you didn't have 50 seats that you you didn't have to have exit signs and I I would not want to chance myself on that because I think fire marshals and whatever are going to I don't, I don't think they're going to let you get away with it, no matter if you had 10 seats. Well, you could get friendly with one fire marshal, but maybe the next one not. Yeah, yeah. It's very subjective, yeah, what they will allow. And not Bing, you're talking about right now the, the current Morrison has sprinklers? It has a deluge system similar to what Daryl has. So it, it just dumps water into the dome uh, in, in case of any kind of conflagration. But we've been assured that what happened at uh, San Mateo will not happen uh, in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. mm -hmm. we, didn't, we didn't before. We, had, no. we didn't have sprinklers in the old one. They were no. behind the dome, as I recall, weren't they? No. Uh, no, no, nothing. There was, there was no fire suppression system at all. In the uh, old none. None. But, uh, the good old days. Yeah. They got away with it in 1950 or whenever when they built the place. 50, yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd get those plastic fish out and be ready anytime. <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of those things you want to sneak in at night. So you can cover the machine. Tap them off. Yeah, or, or yeah, something to cover the machine and then vents in the floor or something, some big drainage system in the floor. Yeah. Actually, we always thought that would be a good thing for the theater anyway, that if you instead of having a carpet, you had just had concrete or whatever and then big drains and you could turn on some water and kind of clean up the place after regular shows and laser shows. I mean, these school groups that bring in a thousand of these little goldfish things and throw them on the floor. And just hose it down. It out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what the movie theater needs so your feet don't stick on the floor. I always yeah. wondered why they put put sprinklers in libraries. What good does that do? Yeah. The books are ruined. Why they'll let them burn mm -hmm. up? Yeah, they'll ruin them one way or the other. Steve, well, I, I had an experience not quite as dramatic as Daryl's when I was running the planetarium at Hartnell College. They've got a new building now, but the old one, they had roofing material over the outside of the dome, running down into this huge trough, which also had roofing material. And only one uh, drain um, going into some sort of downspout. And so there's a big pine tree and that would get filled with water and it would seep down somewhere eventually. So, so one day I came in and it was more of like a water feature. It was kind of pretty, <laughs> just kind of flowing down the, the side of the bricks and into the carpet um, kind of in the front. But, but it, was a, it was a great system because every time they went up there to fix the leak, 
they'd be walking on the roofing material. So they'd create another one. And next time it rained, we'd, we'd have, have it come in somewhere else, but yeah. I had an air conditioner back up that had a, so, you know, supposed to condense. So water was supposed to flow out and it clogged and it backed up. Well, I'm giving a show and I'm talking whatever. And I thought, what's that? It sounds like static. Like there was static in the sound system. I thought maybe there was a potentiometer or volume control was bad or whatever. I don't know what's going on. And I ended the show and the people go out and I look and I see a waterfall over. It's, it's on the other side of the dome from me uh, towards the emergency exit. And there's a waterfall going there. And that's what I was hearing. Um, and then it, it, you know, did nasty things to the carpet and everything, but, and there was no direct way to stop it other than a uh, call for maintenance and hope they could turn off that air conditioning, air handling thing. But it was a waterfall in the planetarium. Not by how design did, though. How did Bishop Museum, uh, which had, when I got there, Spitz A3P serial number two, <laughs> Uh, I uh, followed uh, George Button, bless his heart. Yes. Um, a lot of you guys from Morrison know George. Oh, yeah. Um, George was old school. He was Navy trained, I guess, or some kind of military, very into vacuum tubes, and uh, did a lot of modifications of that whole planetarium after he got a hold of it. <laughs> I got in there, gosh, 20 years after or something like that after George uh, had been there for 20 years. Um, and the planetarium office was in the basement, the planetarium up on the main floor. I get a call during a show from an operator up there saying, there's smoke, there's smoke, there's smoke. And so I run upstairs and uh, sure enough, the, the operator had pushed everybody out through the exit door at least, but there's still smoke billowing up from the console. And so I run back downstairs to the circuit breaker panel boards and switched everything off in the whole building. Went back upstairs, smoke is still pouring out of the uh, console. I got run back downstairs and pull the big main switch above the circuit breaker so there's no power in the building. Smoke is still billowing up and it's still arcing somehow <laughs> from the big old main spits rheostat for the house lights. Oh. Yeah. Uh, by that time, uh, other calls went in to the museum campus electrician who came running over with a fire extinguisher and a screwdriver <laughs> and uh, looked at it and he said, oh, put, turn off the power. I turned it off. Turn off the circuit. I turned them off. Everything is turned off. He looks at it and he says, uh, oh, Mr. Bunton. And he runs back across yeah. campus gets a circuit breaker off in the far, far, far reaches, turns it off, kills the power, comes back in, and he says, uh, George liked to wire things uh, as needed. Yeah. So whatever he found that power from somewhere, from a building next door, pulled yeah. it across underground conduit, wired it up. We then began to undo the charred wires and insulation and things, and began to trace wire back and forth. And one of the wiring runs we found had four different color codes of wire spliced end to end to end to end. He wasted nothing, used all that wire very carefully, but it was a uh, challenge to troubleshoot to uh, get all that out. So eventually we kind of started just pulling wire and rewiring uh, using something like modern electrical code, but it was, it was good fun. It was not to code. I don't know that George ever had any military experience. I know that he came out of Griffith Observatory. Yeah. Was hired, you know, uh, to be the first director of Morrison. Um, but I think uh, he learned, I think I he learned his uh, electronics from Al Gundred. Oh. And uh, Al okay. Gundred was famous. He was a chief technician for the planetarium when it was built yeah. <clears throat> up until, uh, and, and even a little bit after I got there in 60. I think he was still more or less a chief technician in, in, in title, but he, he was actually the shop superintendent and the building operations manager 
okay. uh, later on. But at any rate, um, Al Gunrid liked to wire things with a whole cable of wires that were all the same color. Yeah. And, and, I, and I complained about it. I said, well, are you supposed to know? He said, if you know how to do it, you just ring them out. Said, well, it's a little handier if they're all different colors. And you can see what's supposed to happen. Yeah. You know? But we were all tube technology, you know. So I was I was in the military and I studied tube technology in the fifties. And transistors are never really understood them very well. The the last uh, major technical uh, surprise at Bishop was when it came time to replace the old A three P serial number two with a, a Godo machine. And the, the A3P had the kind of the inverted hexagon base that you may have seen all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, detached and moved off the A3P. And then we said, OK, so how do we get rid of this Formica-lined wooden pedestal base? And I said, well, gosh, you know, let's think about this for a minute. And I put my hand on it and kind of leaned gently against it. And I heard this crack. We wiggled it, crack, 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 and, and basically with two fingers pulled it over because the termites in Hawaii had eaten all around the base. And the thing had just been standing there by luck and balance and gravity for who knows how many years. Well, it the termites were holding hands. On somebody. <laughs> Hawaii. In Kansas City, uh, which was where I was born, by the way, um, uh, much later, back about 10, it's almost 10 years ago now, I went down to help the Astronomical Society of Kansas City. They were trying to get the planetarium going in, in Science City, and it's going very well now. But uh, at the time, they still had one of the uh, Space Voyager or whatever projectors, and it had been very flaky, and they had a video system, and it had done things, but the, but the sharp there was just a star ball. They didn't have planets in the thing. So, but the thing was that um, uh, it was, it gave its last shows by uh, several times smoking and the last time it caught fire. And of course my comment was, hey, that's a heck of a special effect, but you only get to do it once. <laughs> And apparently they uh, found some guy who actually hauled it off and, and paid, he paid to have it hauled off and taken to, I don't know where he was from, but anyway, so they didn't have to pay to, to haul it out of there. Which brings to mind a Vulex Minolta Series 2B, Keith. You remember that machine at Reno, Fleischmann Planetarium. Uh, one April, I was up at the console and my technician, Steve Cleek, was down in the basement, had a big, massive elevator, hydraulic uh, lift elevator. He was down in the basement where the circuit boards and all the control cards for that flaky automation system were. And most of our time spent trying to regain automation over the panorama system or whatever was involved swapping cards from this slot over to this slot, see if the problem moved with it and so on, back and forth, back and forth. So, okay, elevator's down. So I'm yelling over the edge. He's yelling up at the top, you know, okay, try the panorama advance. No, no, no. Okay, let me switch a card. Uh, and it was always, you know, okay, power off, power off, switching cards, switching. Okay, it switched, power on, power on. Try it again. No, power off, power mm -hmm. off, switch, swap cards, swap cards. And uh, he said, okay, power on, power on. And then suddenly bzz, flashing and yelling and screaming and a metal plate hit the floor and whatnot. And I said, oh my God. And I looked over the edge of the pit and there's the whole planetarium staff standing down there staring up at me. It was April Fool's Day. But yeah. I nearly had a heart attack on, on what he had tried to do while the power was on. Good fun. Yeah. It was another one of those religious experiences. Yeah. <laughs> Irreligious experience. I'm trying to remember the name of the head of the 
technical group at Spitz, Charlie, what was this? Holmes. Charlie something, I can't remember his name. This is good back in the 70s. Charles Holmes. Was it Charlie? Yeah, I think it was Charlie Holmes. Yeah. 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 And uh, at the time, I had worked for Spitz for a couple of years and then left and then gone back to Chicago and was working at the Triton College there. And it was one afternoon, we were doing something in the planetarium, just me and you know another staff member, no show or anything. And we had a, you know, one of the real modern 512s with the automation and everything. And, uh, you know, we're there behind the console doing something and we hear this sort of thumpity bump and look up just in time to see the headless planetarium projector now balanced, you know, overbalanced completely, sort of, you know, planet, planet system down, swinging back and forth in its cradle with no star ball. And we look around and there's the snar ball between a couple of seats. <laughs> it had just fallen off, it had a big dent in it. So I got Charlie on the phone, he was in his office. And I remember, hey, Charlie, this is Mike Bennett. And he said, oh, hey, Mike, how you doing? And I said, well, Charlie, the, uh, the star ball just fell off the instrument and has a big dent in the side. <laughs> and he said, uh, Mike, I'm kind of busy, what do you want? <laughs> and I said, Charlie, I'm not kidding. The, you know, the star ball just fell off. And he said, Mike, get on with it. I'm busy. <laughs> it took a little convincing to, for, him, for him to finally believe. <laughs> so, yeah, yes. Art, Art Johnson out in, in Reno had much the same story to tell me. I wasn't there at the time, but Art said during a show on their original Spitz machine, it was on a trolley wheels on a track that would move out to the center of the dome for planetarium shows and then wheel out of the way for the Cinema 360 movie projection show so it wouldn't show a shadow on the, on the, on the sky. He says one day the machine was kind of rattling along these tra tracks, went all the way out to the head, hit the stop, the star ball fell off rolled across to the uh, front of the uh, audience it was in concentric seats at that time. He says, rolled right between the legs of this woman who was just going wild. <laughs> and uh, that was the end of that show. They showed a movie after that. Yes, <laughs> yes Spitz didn't believe in uh, lock washers for their, uh, for bolting the heads on. <laughs> <laughs> it came loose after a while, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh. You want to know the oldest old timer story that will come out of this probably? That was from the original Bishop Museum Planetarium, a three piece, serial number two. Uh, it was supposed to start up a brand new planetarium there funded by the, the Junior League of Women and, and so on. Uh, they hired a retired Naval Lieutenant who was supposed to know all about the sky as the uh, first director. He was building and building and Armin Spitz himself and a couple of people out of uh, not Chad's Ford back before then it was located elsewhere. But anyway, they came out, they did the installation, they were testing things out and the Naval Lieutenant came in to get his training from Armin Spitz. Armin told him a little of this, a little of that and the guys nodded and nodded and okay, fine, yeah, yeah. Okay, the next day, two days before the opening of the planetarium, Lieutenant was never not to be found. He had <laughs> disappeared. He never showed up to even to collect his final paycheck. It just wasn't what he thought he signed up for. <laughs> and so Bishop Museum at that point was going to open a planetarium in two days and had no planetarium operator, no director, no staff, no nobody. And so the director of the museum pleaded with Armin to stick around until we can find somebody to fill this. Can you help us open the planetarium? which he did. So the first planetarium director at Bishop Museum was Armin Spitz. Wow. <laughs> he did it for three or four days and was talking with the museum president and director. And the, the museum president said, well, how do you find a planetarium guy? Where, where are we going to find one in Hawaii? And he says, well, you know, I'll, I'll make a few telexes and telegrams and whatnot to friends on the mainland and see if I can find somebody to fill in. And in the meantime, I'll stay here, I guess. 
And so the telexes began to fly and telegrams and back and forth. And finally, uh, they reached George Bunton hmm. at Morrison, presumably, yeah. and basically said, you know, come on out for a month, please, please help these poor people out uh, until we can find a permanent operator, permanent director. Can you come out for a month? And George said, OK, fine, as long as I can bring my wife, Marie. Yeah. And uh, they said, OK, sure, sure. Come on, we'll, we'll pay a hotel and that kind of stuff. So George came out, stayed for a month. They still had not found another director. Stayed another month. <laughs> stayed another month. Stayed 20 years after he <laughs> retired out of Morrison <laughs> doing the, uh, the planetarium work there. There was a short interim between him and, and me uh, when I uh, joined the planetarium met George, he came in and was talking around. But the first thing he did, of course, is say, oh, well, glad to meet you. And I don't know if you remember, George was lacking a few fingers and his handshake was a surprise to me because I didn't notice that until he grabbed my hand. And I said, well, okay, is that a planetarium injury? And he says, well, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> we never got around to it. But uh, uh, Steve, do you know what happened to those fingers? No. Oh, never told me. Did it happen I, in, I was, in Hawaii? I was hired by uh, George Bunton on the 5th of September, 1960. <laughs> Mike was already working at Morrison as a usher, right, Mike? You're right. Yes, yes. I've always yeah. been very proud of the fact that I started at Morrison before you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you lasted longer. <laughs> I sure did. Uh, I am... Um, uh, George was, was um, a, a very interesting person and really very nice to work for. And I had the, I was the assistant technician, so I had to work Wednesday through Sunday. And George always came in Sunday night to do the Sunday night show. Uh, not the Sunday afternoon, but the Sunday night show. We had an 1130 show, I believe. Yeah. <clears throat> and we right. always came with him and they would have dinner. Uh, downstairs underneath the planetarium there was a, a shop and also a little area where you could eat up food and uh, so they would have their dinner and I would join him for dinner hmm. um, he he did leave rather abruptly uh, and at the same time he left um, uh, Miller what was Miller's first name Mike? Who the, the, the director of the academy? Yeah. Robert uh, Miller Robert, Robert Miller Robert Miller retired, and uh, the planetarium um, did not have a director. Uh, they was hired gone by uh, then. Tom Gates and um, Hal Rolf. Hal Rolf, and, yeah. And and myself, and uh, I think Tom Taggart had already left. He was the chief technician. And we muddled along until 1967. <laughs> When they hired uh, years, uh, yeah. Captain Risser to be the planetarium director, we ran it with a, sort of a committee, and it worked beautifully. Um, I thought. I think Hal Rolf was supposedly the director for a little while, and he got drafted. Into well, the and then he brought Tom Gates in Tom for in a summer, him. but then Tom had to go back to Washington State or something. And didn't come down until a couple of years later as, as you know, full time. And then, of course, he went on to Foothill later on. Yeah. Very interesting time. I was very worried that that uh, uh, it, they would hire somebody I didn't want to work for. <laughs> and uh, so I was. I got George to write me a um, letter of recommendation. Yeah. Uh, I could go get a job somewhere else, but it turned out that everything worked great. I, I've got a, a quick question of the people on my screen here. How many of you, raise your hand or wave it like that. How many of you worked at Morrison at one time or another? <laughs> okay, how many Griffith Park folks? Okay, just curious. Morrison pumped out more than Griffith, I guess, huh? Well, in Northern California. <clears throat> this is a, it's probably a skewed sampling here. Yeah. Right. I've got one quick uh, Spitz uh, story. You know, like I say, I worked for them from 
71 to 73, roughly, as their director of education. Actually, I guess two stories. They, they, uh, they had hired, they decided, you know, they were, uh, at least partly because of that NDA money, they were moving away from putting planetariums into small museums and selling more and more into high schools around the country. California was sort of the exception that most of them went into community colleges. Not all, but most. But uh, around the country, most of them went into high schools. So they realized there was this greater emphasis on, quote, education, unquote, which in those days was sort of unclear what that really meant. But uh, so they, they hired a director of education, an astronomer named Polly Vanek, but she didn't last very long. So then they hired me. Um, and, uh, along, and there were a couple of things I learned real quick. You know, we would go out and visit, uh, you know, on sales calls with the school districts and school superintendents. And uh, on one of the very first trips where I was invited along to be, quote, the planetarium education expert, one of the salesmen, their Spitz had six or seven salespeople in those days around the country. One of them explained to me exactly what my role is. He said, Mike, you have to understand when we go in and start talking to the school superintendent, um, I'm going to lie and you're going to swear to it. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, the other thing was that by the time I got there, they had been purchased by McGraw Hill uh, from, from the uh, original owners, Armand et al., and uh, had moved into that nice new building there in Chad's Ford. But before then, very recently before then, they had worked from where Armand had started the place, at which they shared with a mushroom shed, which was big industry in those days in uh, Delaware. And one of the chief sales guys, uh, who name I, whose name I've now forgotten it, at, uh, at Spitz, remarked that there was actually uh, a lot in common between selling planetariums and raising mushrooms in that they both required darkness and a lot of horseshit. <laughs> <laughs> I remember something you had us do one time, Ken. Uh, I was in the planetarium and Dale Etheridge comes in with a ladder and a ruler and he says, well, got a thing from Ken Miller. He wants us to measure the diameter of our stars on the wall of the planetarium. And of course, <laughs> most of them we couldn't get to. I had to climb on the back of chairs and stuff. Yeah. But we got the diameters for you. <laughs> uh, it's, it was an ongoing uh, battle when the first well, when Goto came back into the U.S., they'd been there way back when, then they gave up on the U.S. market for a while and then came back in when I joined them again. And it was teaching people that A3P stars are that size and the Goto stars are that size. Yeah. And we had to show it to them by measurements and such. But uh, it was a fun time. It was uh, fun. And I will make no comment about lying to customers or having somebody <laughs> swear to it. Yes. I believe Never. Ken Never. Had, uh, had me uh, measure the stars for the Minolta at the time, yeah. the M15, yeah. just to see what, how that fit. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was like in uh, 92 or so, 91, 92. And we had the smallest stars in the industry at that point, and may still. So if you're teaching an astronomy course in the, uh, and you're teaching the part about how do you measure the size of a star? <laughs> well, you get out a ladder and yeah. uh, <laughs> climb on top of your chairs. <laughs> yeah. Ken, I, I worked on a go to S1. Is that, yep. that, that existed? Yeah, a little stubby machine with a little bit of planet business on the bottom of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah and I took it. I took it to my apartment. I, <laughs> I know this was between sixty and sixty-three because that's the only time I ever lived in an apartment. And I remember working <laughs> on it at home, yeah. and I can't remember what was wrong with it, but it had been damaged in some way. And I got it fixed and gave it back to whoever owned it. And I don't, I don't remember. Anything else? I just remember the projector. 
<laughs> it's actually very, very nicely made. Yeah, there's there's one down in, I think it's Fort Lauderdale down in Florida in a, a side little lobby, one of those little S1 or S2 machines, uh, still chugging away last mm -hmm. time that I was there anyway. Hey, does anybody remember, you know, what is the worst uh, incident you've had with a, uh, we've been talking about technical issues a lot and machinery and stuff, but what is the, what are some memories about, are there incidents with audience members or students that are vivid in your memory? Yeah. Well, with laser shows, you sure had some good ones. <clears throat> I got one. Um, at CSM, we took, you know, we teach planetarium uh, classes, one of the astronomy classes in the planetarium. And our projector was down, you know, for some maintenance, but we only had like a cardboard cover yeah, we didn't have the real regular cover. And the seats were all around the, the planetarium. I was always making sure, hey, students, make sure don't, you know, don't lean on it because. So this one student had this big ass backpack and he was talking to his friend. <laughs> As he swung, his backpack fell off through the cardboard Oh, and hit the machine down in the pit. And I said, God damn it. <laughs> so he was traumatized because I got pissed. I never get pissed. He saw me piss. Mm -hmm. And then we had to sort of reach down X amount of feet to pull his backpack up out of the pit. And then we had to call uh, John here and company to come out and see if we brought the projector up. We didn't notice anything, but we still had to call and make sure, you know, it was all aligned. It came out. It was a little bit surprisingly. It didn't do much damage, but that that scared the piss out of me. And the, the student was shaking, and he thought he was going to get an F instantly. Uh -huh. it, no, 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 I held my composure. No, and he was really, can I do anything? He said, no, no, just please leave. That's, take your backpack and go. And he, he didn't drop the course, but he always sat in the back of the <laughs> area after that. So that was the hairiest because it could have been really bad, but it wasn't. It was more of an adjustment and, and they were able to fix it. But yeah, that was scary. One time I was doing a program for high school students. Independence Planetarium was at a high school. And the stars are on, it's dark. We're, you know, finding constellations or doing, I don't remember what program it was. And all of a sudden the whole sky goes. <laughs> the kid had taken his big old tennis shoe off and thrown it at the star ball oh, and hit it. <laughs> So I turned on the lights. I just flipped on the white lights, which every, hurts everybody's eyes, and walked over. And I said, "Okay, everybody, put your feet up." I had the shoe, <laughs> <laughs> just like Cinderella. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, right. that's okay. You and all of your friends in that row are out of here. <laughs> Strong evidence. Yeah. Yeah. At at Morrison, uh, when I started lecturing there in '63 or '4, something like that. Um, that we still had the policy of, uh, of letting kids in under five years old. But the usher would make sure they sat on an aisle seat real close to one of the exits. And so if the kid got noisy, the usher could, you know, pretty quickly usher, you know, mom and, and kid out. And so it was not uncommon that at some point during a show, some kid would just get really scared and start screaming, <laughs> you know, some little baby. And you know, just bring everything to a screeching halt. But we had a, a pretty ready-made response before too long, which was uh, whenever the kids started screaming, at least this is what I did, I'd stop and say, well, of course, not everybody agrees with that last statement I made. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we'll continue on anyhow, you know, <laughs> after the screaming disappeared through the exit door. <laughs> Mike, you, you may remember in some of our shows um, that we would talk about the age of the universe and that usually could spike a reaction from 
let's say a religious group and uh, more than a few times sitting there as an usher, uh, they would all get up and leave by one of the exits. <laughs> Unfortunately, we had an exit that opened up to the outside uh, yes, yes. and letting in the, in, the, in the sunlight. So they made quite a statement and uh, that was hard to follow up. I, I don't know what you would have said, but uh, we all held our breath. There was, there's a story and I can't, vouch for the truth of it, and Steve, maybe Steve can, that at, during one show, uh, you know, you could get behind the dome of the Morrison Planetarium. There was an access door from, you know, from one of the areas outside the dome. And a lot of stuff was stored back there because uh, there was a, quite a space between the, you know, the aluminum dome and the structural dome. And at some point during a show, one of the staffers, forgot that there was a show going on and opened up the the you know this access door and was sort of sort of you know looking down at the dome and realized that it was dark inside uh, and you know and quickly shut it and the lecturer was sort of stunned into silence momentarily and a little voice popped up from the audience saying mommy i just saw god yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is, that's this, it was the door at the top of the stairs by, uh, by my office, and that did happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there that's are many similar story. incidents like that. Yeah. 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 And just, just before one of, uh, before my very first show in 1975, uh, I was getting ready. To, it was an evening show, so they gave me one that didn't have a very big audience, just for safety. Uh, and then one of the other lecturers, was working late and was just on his way out. I'm looking at you, Mike. Was it me? It was you. And I said, I made the mistake of saying it's my first show tonight. And oh. you know, out of the, you know, out of the goodness of your heart, you turned around and said, let me tell you about all the things that can go wrong during your first show. <laughs> Would I do that? No. <laughs> Must have been some other Mike. <laughs> uh, it sounds like you, Mike. <laughs> of course, I did. I, this actually happened to me. Some show where we were talking about, you know, the the lifetime of the sun and it's going to burn out and, you know, and expand yada yada in four billion years. And honest to God, I, I sort of hate to say this, but at the end of the show, a, the classic little old lady <laughs> came up to me at the console and said, young man, did you say million or billion? <laughs> I said, uh, billion. And she said, oh, I'm so relieved. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget the, uh, the special show that uh, Keith Johnson put on for the PPA conference up in Reno, where he the whole show was on the premise of a someone who was suddenly thrust into having to give a, a um, his first planetarium program, yeah. and it, that was hilarious. And I still remember that Keith. It was it was really good. Everything you could possibly think of went wrong, and the timing was just was just right. I mean, it was. <laughs> well, I just took I that know. from my experiences attending other people's <laughs> shows at my own shows. <laughs> Everything went wrong. I assembled into one show. Yeah. Was that a lot where, of, a lot did of you have a picture of a slide burning up? Uh, yeah, I think, I think so. Know, there was I a, think I did. Yeah. Yeah. The time, all sorts of everything. It was just, it was great. Just a, as, as, as an example, the, the cardinal points came up in the wrong positions. <laughs> your slides and then they would come down they come up again still in the wrong positions and finally they would all slide <laughs> along the dome to the right position <laughs> i i had more fun with that i kept revising it every year i wish i still had a copy that i could play for the last version but i think there's a lot of slide fun. base you know so yeah it'd be hard to do but yeah that you, was good I, I remember i don't know whether it was you or tom gates but we had hired a new part-time lecturer at the planetarium, some guy that worked at, you know, was an astronomer from San Francisco State. And he practiced and he practiced and, you know, sounded, sounded good, looked good, you know, he was gonna be fine. And his very first sh show, it may have been Tom, I can't remember. Uh, his very first show was, I think, an, 
an afternoon show, and it was pretty full. And uh, me and whoever, you know, whether it was you or Tom, were sort of in the back room, wanted to kind of listen in on the talk back just to hear how he was doing. And it turned out he had rigorously practiced about the first five minutes of the show. And after that, he hadn't, he'd sort of just figured he'd wing it. And he was apparently very nervous because within 10 minutes, he was speaking in garble. <laughs> you know, he was just rambling and wow. was sort of randomly throwing switches in hopes that something came on that he could talk about next. And we literally had to go, you know, break into the show and escort him out of the console and into the back room. And, and then one of us took over the show. <laughs> but uh, that was his first show lasted about 10 minutes. His first and last wow. show lasted about 10 minutes. He didn't bother to come back after that. I had to take him out in a straitjacket. Just about. <laughs> I remember the incident, but I don't remember the man's name. No. Good. <laughs> People always believe that the weird stuff was going to happen in laser shows. Honestly, the most weird stuff always happened on some random Sunday afternoon, middle of the afternoon star show. The laser shows couldn't hold a candle to it. Yeah. So I'll tell you the worst, which was, you know that you give the standard announcement that tells people if you go out, you can't come back in. Now, I know some places you can't, but you know, we were like most, of, so yeah. we're trying to encourage them. Not if they go out, we ask that you, you know, you're not supposed to come back in. Well, unfortunately, there was one guy that took this to heart. So I'm standing there and, and gone live pointing out something on the sky. Some guy over in the corner on an aisle takes his pants, zips down, whips it out, and starts urinating on the floor. Oh, now, I want to tell you, when you're trying to concentrate on pointing something in the sky, this is not helpful. And the best thing you can do <laughs> beyond stopping just mortified is to quickly find a way to end the show. Like, it's time for, you know, uh, the end of the evening, and that's it and get everybody out of there and hope that you can, you know, check the floor and whatever over there. But I will tell you that that really will mess up your, your life, Sky. Oh my God. So there you go. Never heard that. This guy just didn't want to miss anything, huh? So he just- That's right. It yeah. just was so good <laughs> that he didn't want to leave. And so, yeah. Well, so there's my, tell you there's that my worst. In the laser shows, we had two sets of doors, so there's a about a four or five foot area between the inner and the outer doors, and that got used a lot of times for a urinal during the yeah. laser show. Very common. Oh yeah, it could, but in the theater, and and, no, and it was during a star talk. I don't recall it ever happening in the theater. A lot of vomiting. I mean, people not, blow uh, chunks a few times, but I don't remember anybody. Ever <laughs> yeah, but at least they didn't blow chunks at my lecture, you know. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sorry I asked. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose this is disgusting. Few, <laughs> I suppose we've all found a few dirty or wet diapers tucked around the seats as well. Yeah. But have any of you actually found a bra? No, I did. I there. did once. The bra mm -hmm. and a pair of panties. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't want to even speculate. <laughs> Somebody what was going on there. Maybe not the show. <laughs> there was a, a legend that somewhere in Canada, and I don't remember where it was, and this was early days, like 70s, that there was a school group that came into a larger theater and they were very unruly. And the lecturer threw that they were mixed in with several other school groups and they threw the group out because they were rowdy and noisy. And then when they went to clean, they found several pairs of underwear where the teachers supposedly were sitting. So they were obviously not monitoring the <clears throat> students. But again, I don't remember exactly where it was. And that was way, way back there from like 76, something like that. But it sounds like Keith was giving the same show. 
<laughs> yeah. I think our planetarium at uh, Lawrence Hall of Science one time was was uh, uh, got an award from a magazine called Diablo Magazine for the best <laughs> best planetarium to go make out in. Yeah, <laughs> I can't imagine why because it's just a tiny planetarium. It's... <laughs> yeah. Obviously, had comfortable benches or seats or something. Oh yeah, they were. Yeah. Did they reveal how many planetariums they uh, tried this out? You know, so it's, it's the best one. You know, what, what was the worst one? <laughs> they they were bench seats actually. So uh, yeah, if there was room enough, you. Well, could... that, made, that made it a lot easier, I think. <laughs> I guess at the other end of the spectrum, I had this. I'm sure everybody's had this experience where. You know, you get the same parents and the same kids coming back every single week. And um, this mom brought her, her daughter, Olive, and she was like four years old, but she would sit through the kids show and then really sit through the, the adult shows too. You know, and after, I don't know, weeks of, of showing up for every, every variety of show I, I showed, she came back and revealed that at home, Olive, would pretend in her room to be me so ah. she'd like you know set up her dolls and give planetarium shows at home so oh, cute oh. That, that was adorable she was practicing yeah yep. where is she now <clears throat> yeah yeah actually I, I i've been in touch with her mom but uh, yeah she's probably she works probably at grad school now at uh, at uh, 12 years old yeah, or something. Right. Ah. Ah. Be planetarian. All right. I once uh, had an elementary school teacher cancel her field trip at the last moment because it was raining. <laughs> I thought this was kind of puzzling. Or she, she, they just called up to cancel. So I called back and talked to the school and and talked to the teacher. And she said, "Well, it was raining, and I didn't think you could see the stars if it rained during the day." during the day right and i said why don't you drop by are you very far away why don't you drop by after, after school today and we'll we'll have we'll do a little tour for you she said oh my after we got done with a little tour i explained how the earth works she hadn't been to a planetarium before and she was sure that we were going to open the sky and see the stars right okay, you know i had more I had one occasion where somebody came up to me after the show and and uh, as a testament to the beauty of the Morrison Planetarium sky, they'd say, how did you get the dome off so quietly? Yeah. <laughs> I had one of my mother's friends had been to the planetarium and she told me that it was wonderful the way they could just open this dome up and you could yeah. see the real stars. Yeah. I tried to explain to her, but and no, she was convinced. So sometimes that happens in the middle of the day. Imagination. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it wouldn't be the first time that people would show up with heavy coats and blankets <laughs> and uh, caps thinking that uh, they were going to look out through an observatory. Yeah. Got that confused. Well, there was a time, oh, in the early days of Independence High School, which was kind of an experimental campus. I mean, California oh, had this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my That's what you're known for. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> that uh, an officer from the National Science Foundation came to take a tour of campus. And one of the uh, vice principals was his tour guide and he brought him around to the planetarium. I knew they were coming and knocked on the door and I opened up and stuff. And he introduced me as the campus astrologer. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy from the NSF's mouth just kind of fell open like, what? <laughs> This is California, but are you guys really that flaky? <laughs> of course, you know, I developed, you know, when people ever confused, you know, talk to, talk to me about astrologer, astrology, uh, I got to the point where I would just tell them that uh, I just thank my lucky stars I don't believe in astrology. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my, you have uh, to think off, guys, but... Uh, I was about to say before Mike signed off, my teaching credential from the 
California Community College District. It says topic, um, astronomy and astral physics. Yes, mine does too. Astral. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. California. And when I show that to people, I say, oh, it's California. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a friend uh, who was a telescope technician up at Observatory, worked the 120 inch. And when um, the different astronomers would come up to uh, do their research things, he would call them astrologers just every once in a while, slip that in just to see what kind of reaction. Well, and then there's the cosmetologists. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <No> one, yeah. <laughs> a friend of my mother's once that I hadn't seen in a long time, I said, oh, I hear that you work in a planetarium. And I said, yes. And she said, it must be so nice to be around all those green and growing things. <laughs> <laughs> I've had people mistake that before. Oh, no, I've had, <laughs> had that happen. I just had a notice come it across. a while for me to get it, too. We just had a notice come across the screen that uh, they're releasing uh, UFO reports on CSN. So uh, we should get a lot of calls pretty soon. <laughs> we still get job applications from people who say, I, I've been interested in astrology all my life. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's a no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that uh, UFO report is out. It's available for your viewing now. It's mere nine pages long. So yeah. Nine oh, pages, wow. Bing, I thought you were going to say uh, we got um, requests from people who said I've been interested in astronomy ever since I was uh, took a ride abducted. In a, in yeah. <laughs> abducted after ever since my abduction. <laughs> ever since I returned from Zephyr. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I also blame Griffith for some confusion that people have when they think they're applying to a planetarium and they say I, I'm really looking forward to operating the big telescope. Yeah. I think a planetarium yeah. is an observatory. Yeah, yeah. it is. Observatory. Yeah. Why is that Griffith's fault? Griffith Observatory. And planetarium. Well, because they are an observatory too. Yeah. Yeah, you shouldn't measure. If you'd uh, like, I'd blame versus... Chabot. <laughs> yeah. Planetarium versus observatory based on the size of the domes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Alan, I've got to sign off. Keep it up, no. guys. Keep it up. Ken, All good right. to see you, Ken. Bye, Ken. Good to see you, yeah. Ken. Bye-bye. Right. Okay. Right. Helen, I'm, I'm going to have to sign off, too. I've got a, something else coming up at 3. And uh, I, I'm glad you put this together. Uh, I'm glad to see all of you guys and gals. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I hope we somehow or other this can happen again sometime. Yeah, I, I well, know, I, I think that's our that that may be our cue actually that uh, you know we might all be ready to sign off because uh, we are old timers. That but uh, it, maybe show of hands, who's interested in actually having another one, a follow up session, and we have one. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll put out a I'll put out a, a a when is good kind of query and see. Okay, and thanks everybody for coming. This is thanks, uh, Alan. Well, thank, thank you for doing it. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. And thanks, thanks everyone else. It's good to very, see very you. Very nice. Nice to see right. everybody. Yeah. Take care. See you, Steve. Bye -bye. Thank okay. you. Bye. 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 Yeah. Bye.